Good afternoon, good day, good morning to any, to everyone, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this Humor Book Launch. This is a forum of acknowledgement and critical engagement of work being produced in and on the African continent, particularly relevant to Humor's intellectual agenda and research focus. This is a space for critical discussion of selected books with authors invited to discuss their books with the audience and a panel of experts working in similar fields. My name is Minen Tlenlube and I am a doctoral fellow at HUMA. In today's session, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Vanya Gastro, who for over a decade has studied and written about immigrant run shops and small businesses in South Africa. Her work has covered shopkeepers, experiences of crime and xenophobia in the country, the ability to access formal and informal justice systems, the regulation of their businesses, and their role in local economies. Gastro holds a PhD in Migration Studies from the University of Witwatersrand and is a research associate at the Center for Law and Society at the University of Cape Town. Her book, published by New York University Press, is called Citizen and Pariah, Somali Traders and the Regulation of Difference in South Africa. And this is a text on migrants in South Africa who have set up informal spaza shops in townships across the country, supplying surrounding residents uh, with essentials. Gastro in this book investigates the predicament of these modern day pariahs or outcasts who belong neither to the elite nor the common people who are frequently the focus of xenophobic anger. In doing so, she sheds light on the nature and workings of xenophobia in South Africa today and how democratic and constitutional frameworks erode in context of heightened nationalism, populism and economic inequality. Her discussant is Abdi Kadir Mohammed, who is the chairperson of the South Africa Refugee Led Network in the Western Cape. Of the, and uh, he's also the director of the Somali Association of South Africa. Thank you so much, Dr. Castro, for being at HUMA to uh, speak about your book that we've been waiting to hear for so long. And we also welcome your discussant, Mohammed. You may have the floor. And uh, following your presentation will be a Q&A. Thank you very much. It's very exciting to be here today and launch my book with humor. Um, they've been a really wonderful team and organized invitations and posters and Zoom. And um, yeah, I'm very, very grateful for the really excellent work that they did. Um, and yeah, I think when, when one writes a book, um, I, it, one doesn't do it alone um, you need a lot of help from different people and so there's several people I want to quickly thank before I get on to discussing the book. Um, first of all, I want to thank Mohammed Aden Osman. He was someone and still is someone I work closely with, I speak to regularly and he was actually the first um, Somali national I ever met in my whole life. Um, I met him in Cape Town um, more than 10 years ago and he helped me with my re and he's basically helped me with my research since then um, he's not here today but he will watch the podcast he's working he's based in Birmingham now um, but I miss him and I wish he'll be he was here and maybe next time he'll be able to attend um, then I'd also like to thank Dee Smythe and Jemima Thomas and I also saw D Diane Jeff Jeffers attending today from the Center for Law and Society at the University of Cape Town um, and the public law department at UCT, they gave me the space to um, work and yeah, the creative license to write a book um, in a way that I wanted to. Um, and yeah, I, I, they enabled me to really, really realize the project. And so I'm really grateful to all of them. And um, importantly is also Wits University Press. So the book is being distributed by NYU Press overseas, but in South Africa, um, my publisher is Wits University Press, and they worked brilliantly on the book. I couldn't have um, hoped for a better team. So Veronica Klipp, Rashan Carter, Karina van der Spool, 
um, Catherine Dam Damerell, and they also arranged for Alison Lowry to be my copy editor, and they did excellent work. Um, ACMS at the University of the Witzwaterstrand. Um, I'm very grateful to team there, and they gave me the opportunity to actually enter the field. Uh, my first project looking at migration and law and society was with the African Center for Migration and Society at WITS. Um, I'm not sure if he's in the meeting yet, but I'd like to say thank you to Mohamed Ali Mire. He's the Somali ambassador to South Africa, and he was also hoping to attend today. Um, I'm very glad that he's also participating. Um, my friends and family, I can see several you know, relatives, um, my parents um, are also attending today. Um, I'd really like to thank Abdi Kadir Mohammed, who's the discussant. I've known him for a very long time and worked closely with him, and I'm really happy that he was able to um, partake in the launch. And my husband, Kamaran, who's always supported me in whatever kind of endeavor or interest I pursue. And yeah, um, I don't know whether I would have had such an interesting career if he wasn't supporting me all along. So now, yeah, so I think I've covered um, key people. There might be others. Maybe I'll have to send them emails later and say thank you as well. Um, but now I'll start um, discussing the book itself. And the, the inspiration for writing the book actually came many years ago. And at the time, actually, I wasn't planning on writing a book. Um, but my interest in foreign shopkeepers um, arose co completely um, coincidentally. I was a candidate attorney at a law firm in Cape Town in 2009. And I happened to be in the competition department and my director one morning came past all flustered and showed me a newspaper article um, in the Cape Times. And the article was titled, One-Sided Deal for Spaza Owners. And it discussed an informal trade agreement that had been negotiated between South African and Somali shopkeepers in Gugaletu. And the terms of the agreement, this in informal kind of arrangement, it wasn't legislation, was that Somali shopkeepers could only make up 30% of the Spaza shopkeepers. Spaza shops are informal grocery shops. They could only make up 30% of Spaza shopkeepers in the township. They had to fix their prices to the prices of their South African competitors, competitors so, so they couldn't charge lower prices. And they also had to move their shops at least 100 meters away from South African shops. And so my director at the law firm was obviously quite um, concerned about this and um, was almost more concerned that the Competition Commission was notified about the agreement and the Competition Commission's response was that not all arrangements that appear anti-competitive are competitive. And it didn't look like they were willing to do any proper investigation or make any kind of um, negative statement about the arrangement. And the arrangement was also supported by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So my director at the law firm asked me to write an opinion piece, which I did. And But after that, this whole arrangement lingered on in my mind. I felt really confused by it and a bit perplexed. Um, I think that I came of age in the 1990s where um, we are celebrating the anti-apartheid struggle against the discrimination and celebrating equality. And so these, this informal arrangement, um, it sort of made me uncomfortable. And I was, but also in a way curious to see how did this come about and why did the authorities not want to do anything about it? And so, yeah, and so the, and that curiosity eventually led me to want to write this book because um, I felt that, yeah, I, I felt that the desire among South Africans to kind of crack down foreign retailers and curtail their ability, their livelihoods, I think it, 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 there was something in it that was important for us as South Africans and even more globally to understand. I think there's something there that we could learn about society and politics and law. 
And so what is the book based on? Um, it's based on qualitative research that I carried out in Cape Town between 2010 and 2013 on the ability of foreign shopkeepers to access formal and informal justice mechanisms when they're victims of crime. And I was recruited on this project by the African Center for Migration and Society. Um, and it involved interviewing, I think, 66 foreign spaza shopkeepers, South African, 65 South African residents, 20 police officers, I interviewed four prosecutors, as well as local government officials, community leaders, NGOs, to look at um, the ability of foreign nationals to access formal and informal just foreign shopkeepers and um, their ability to access formal and informal justice. And I kept in the back of my mind, I remembered that agreement in, in Google Air too. So throughout my research, I was also I also kind of explored um, informal kind of agreements as a means of also trying to address crime and address um, attacks on shopkeepers. So informal regulation also fell within the ambit of my research. Um, and since then, I've, I've carried out subsequent qualitative research on um, the informal sector, in particular for the South African, um, Southern African Migration Program headed by Jonathan Crush. Um, and the book also relies on um, literature, media, policy research to cover national level events because eventually it became clear that this issue around foreign shopkeepers isn't just, um, isn't just limited to Cape Town and it's actually um, developments that happened on a national level. Um, and then after deciding to write a book, I had to decide what kind of style of book do I want to write? And strangely, I had a very clear um, idea from the beginning um, what I was aiming to do. And it wasn't necessarily a very kind of conventional academic book where you publish a series of essays, where you review literature and identify your little, you know, how your work relates to other arguments in academic literature. I wanted to write more of a book of reportage, like a journalistic style of writing. Um, and, and it's quite chronological. It starts off um, with early efforts more than 10 years ago to try and regulate and curtail foreign Somali shopkeepers, but then eventually nationally foreign shopkeepers in general. Um, and there are many reasons for why I chose the style of reportage. Um, and because I, and firstly, it was because the previous efforts to write on the topic left me quite dissatisfied. So I'd written several reports um, on crime affecting Somali retailers, the regulation of, um, you know, foreign in informal businesses. Um, and though, although these reports had very valuable information in them, um, I, I felt that they hadn't, there were deeper kind of more theoretical um, lessons one could take from the state of affairs. And so thereafter, I thought doing a PhD was a good idea to try and um, flesh out the kind of, and analyze um, these events through, yeah, with refer looking at different theories. But that also left me feeling like I hadn't really um, understood the phenomenon. And I, after finishing my PhD, I and starting the book, I felt that a lot of the insights and meanings of events were actually in the details rather than the generalizations. So they were reflected in the personalities, the attitudes, expressions, and sentiments of individuals, in the furnishings, the smells, the refreshments I was given, the atmospheres of venues, homes, and neighborhoods that I visited. And my, my PhD and my reports hadn't really reflected any of that. Um, for example, there's a lot you can learn just by looking at someone's living quarters behind their shop or, um, you know, some an, an interaction with a smug kind of court official. And then those kind of small, yeah, like, yeah, day to day details, which my work hadn't really captured. And so I thought writing a book in a journalistic fashion with a lot of detail and close attention to um, 
yeah, that everyday events would help help me understand and also maybe help readers um, understand the the phenomena better. And yeah, and I can see I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip some of the writing part, and maybe I can discuss it more in the questions. Um, so apart from being interested in the details, um, the, the journalistic, the reportage style of writing, I also chose it because I, I, I see my book as an intervention. Um, and therefore, I'm not just aiming to speak at an exclusively academic audience. Um, I'm trying to, um, yeah. And sometimes I feel when you trying to persuade people, um, I felt that it might be better to show people through imagery, through experiences, rather than tell people, which is often what you do as an academic. You propose theories, you write quite normatively as to what you think um, is right or wrong. Um, and I was more, I thought it might be more persuasive as, as an intervention to rather let the reader um, decide for themselves um, to kind of take them through a, a course of events and experiences and let them decide. And so most of the more academic theoretical analysis is, is more towards the end. You need to read, unfortunately, you need to read the entire book <laughs> to, um, to really, yeah, to, to really understand it. Um, and then towards the end is where I kind of put my thoughts forward um, as, and try and explain my view of, um, yeah, of the phenomena that I describe. So challenges writing the book, oi, I wrote too much, I think, um, that there, yeah, so writing a book um, started out quite difficult. Um, one, one challenge is that for about two years, you've got hardly any deliverables because you're working on a book. And sometimes you think you're going a bit crazy because, you know, you hope that you are working on a book, but, you know, you don't get much, um, you don't have much evidence for it until it gets published. Um, and I had my second child in the middle of writing this book, which I wouldn't recommend anyone do if they're trying to write a book. I think my sister will relate also. Um, you get constantly interrupted, you've got to write a little 15 minute time slot. Um, but the thing is, it's also possible because I did complete the book with um, crazy children running around me all the time. Um, and, and I also had to kind of train myself to write in a different way. I'd been writing reports, I'd been writing book chat, you know, kind of more academic book chapters, I'd been writing theses. And I, with this book, because it's more journalistic, I had to kind of rewrite sections over and over again to get rid of what I termed the report style of writing. I kept reverting back to it and then I'd have to, um, yeah, redo whole sections. Um, but towards the end, it got much easier and it became more of a natural style of writing for me. Um, and so, boy, okay, what is the book about? So I've got to try and be succinct here. Um, Citizen and Pariah, and oh, you can't really see it, it's on the bookshelf behind me. Um, it explores the entry of Somali spaza shopkeepers into South Africa's low income township neighborhoods and how they encounter and navigate new and often hostile political and legal contexts. Um, the book is divided into three parts. The first part is titled Arrival and Reception, and it traces the arrival of Somali refugees and asylum seekers to South Africa since the beginning of the country's democratic dispensation in the 1990s. Um, it explores how they settled in the country and established small enterprises in the country's townships, um, where they've experienced social isolation and severe levels of violent crime. So that's more of the background. And then the second part is titled Regulation and Containment. And that part examines how local South African retailers have, mobili have mobilized at times violently against foreign owned shops, including Somali shops. Um, it sets out how government 
Governance actors ranging from police, community leaders, and politicians have responded to local antagonism by attempting to curtail Somali and other foreign businesses through informal and formal regulatory interventions. Um, local leaders and state officials attempt to justify clampdowns um, by blaming foreign retailers for all types of social ills, be it crime, threat to public health, and economic decline. Um, and these efforts and strategies raise questions about the state of human rights, plurality, and the rule of law in contemporary South Africa. And then the final part of the book is, is called The Politics of Pariahdom, and, and it investigates what the problem and problematization of foreign shopkeepers um, and state efforts to curtail the enterprises reveal about contemporary South African politics. It concludes by exploring how socially marginalized groups who lack popular power attempt to pursue justice. And in discussing the above, the book attempts to disrupt myths and expose the hypocrisy of much political read reasoning about Somali and foreign small businesses in the country. It also tries to reveal the underlying motivations of many political leaders for mobilizing against marginal and outsider groups. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to um, discuss much more because I think I've run out of time. So you, I'll, I'll um, elaborate further in the question section. And so on that note, I'd just like to thank everyone again for attending my launch. I appreciate it very much. And if you are interested in purchasing the book, um, it's available. There are no excuses because it's available on Take A Lot, on Loot, at Clark's Bookstore, at the Book Lounge, at Exclusive Books, and there are probably other retailers too that will be stocking it. So yeah, happy reading everyone. Um, and I think Abdi Kadir of the Somali Association of South Africa and the South African um, Refugee-led network um, will now briefly also make some statements. Thank you, Vanya. Thank you, um, Abdi Kadir, for um, coming. I will allow Abdi Kadir to intervene. Uh, thank you so much. Uh... Vanya, and thank you so much, Tube. Uh, Tube, if I pronounce your name properly or not, you tell me. I should be pronouncing South African names by now properly, I'm sure. We haven't been in the country for decades. Uh, let me start by, first of all, thanking Vanya Gastro for inviting me to be a discussant of this important book that she has written uh, that details the, the challenges that Somali shopkeepers are facing uh, and tackles different parts of the challenges, whether it's in the townships, whether it's from uh, government officials, whether it's politicians or, you know, the different role players. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, the Department of Humanities for hosting this lounge. <laughs> I, I normally like uh, this kind of events to happen face to face, physically. Uh, that's more engaging for me than uh, the online uh, platforms. The reason is because internet is not reliable most of the time. I've been in and out right now. I've missed almost three quarter of what Vanya was talking about. And probably I am just assuming that she was talking about the book. I only had the last part. And uh, um, I obviously have, uh, uh, you know, uh, prepared what I'm going to say about the book. I have read and I have the, I got the opportunity to read it. And I would like to start by, uh, first of all, thanking Vanya Castro for taking all those years uh, doing research, taking risks many times, and moving around in places where she doesn't even know anybody. And uh, the, also the most important thing I want to mention in the beginning of my statement and my discussion is the fact that Vanya Castro understands the dynamics of the different communities around Cape Town and probably uh, she can interact with any foreign national and she can also interact with South Africans as well uh, in the same level. So that, that is something that many South Africans, academic South Africans, let me say, do not really have that, those kind of qualities. And that is a specific quality that 
uh, I can see, I have seen in the uh, Vanya Gastro for the years that he has been doing research. The book is the final part of all the research he was doing, but there, was, there are a lot of other books she has written, uh, not like the one that she has just published now on lunch today. The economics, uh, the one that they call it uh, Somali or Som Somali nomics, I think Vanya, the name was Somali economics, something like that. I remember those books and uh, all these years he has been doing research and it is a practical one and it really highlights the challenges that Somali traders and other uh, foreign nationals are facing in the townships and in South Africa in general. And then the other point I want to mention is that my perspective is going to be the one of a, a, of an activist of uh, somebody who has been in the field, civil society field, who has been in the, you know, in, in the forefront with regards to advocacy and other nationalities as well. And uh, it's not going to be the perspective of uh, carrying books and blah, blah, blah. And start by using the saying of Albert Einstein, where he said that the only source of knowledge is experience. The best knowledge is experience. So when when you, are, you have a lot of information and you're at the university, you see, for example, and you're sitting behind a well-ventilated air-conditioned building, and you're reading through a laptop or a computer, and you're reading a news report from any newspaper around the country that Somali traders, two Somali traders were killed in a snipe. There was a looting that took place in some place, somewhere there in a township. You're not really experiencing what that really means. So practically, that is where I'm coming from. And uh, I would like to start by mentioning and uh, you know, quoting or even giving some more in-depth explanation of some of the things that uh, our communities go, go through. And uh, I think I will start by saying the most difficult part that is very painful that we experience is when politicians who are watched on TV nationally by millions of South Africans and followed and supported and voted for by millions of South Africans utter words that are instigating violence against foreign nationals. So for example, you can name them. They can be from different political parties. It's not, no one is out safe from it. Everyone is part of it, let me say. And this could be sometimes campaigning, they have their own uh, they normally do, which sometimes has got results, and sometimes the result is xenophobia. So outbreak of xenophobia and looting and, and you know, a lot of uh, violence that follows it. So I would like to pinpoint uh, also uh, a statement from late minister, of the, uh, deputy minister of uh, trade and industry, Elizabeth Tabete, who is late now, who died in March 2021, in October 2013, at, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in a place called White River in Pumalanga. She mentioned that uh, the most, uh, you know, many spaza shops with African names, but when you go into it, uh, into, into buy into it, and you want to buy something, you find your, your Mohammeds, and most of them are not even registered. So basically what she's saying, the late minister was saying is that if you go into these shops, you'll find Somalis. That's what basically she means. Mohammed is because many of our community names uh, start with Mohammed or there is Mohammed in one of the names, either the surname or the middle name, which is the reason because many people do not understand that uh, we normally get this name because we name ourselves of, uh, after our black prophet, Mohammed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's why we have got this name repeating. Many South Africans also have a lot of names that are popular. But when she says this, she is somehow saying that we are not Africans, according to her statement. Even if our, our names and surnames are Mohammed, they're still Africans. And if the, Afri the shop's uh, name is African, and you go inside, you find Mohammed, Mohammed is still an African. It doesn't mean that Mohammed is, is from somewhere else. You know, so this, this is the kind of statement that we always remember. And it's always echoed in our ears. I'm not sure uh, too bad how much time I have because I have a lot to say, and probably I don't know how much time you'll, you'll allow me. Uh, is it 20 <laughs> minutes or is it 15 minutes? I'm not sure. Uh, I would like to know how, how much time I have basically. 
I already started, but uh, uh, you are mute. Uh, if you can um, tell me, please. Thank you, Mohammed. You may carry on for a further five uh, to ten minutes, and then we will okay. dedicate the rest of the session to questions. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Um, I, will, I would like to also speak about uh, a lot of operations that have got different names. Uh, these operations uh, are different and they came at different times. And most of them, they had some uh, reasons that why these operations are, uh, you know, in the first place uh, put in place and why government has announced that they're going to have this kind of operation. And then sometimes, not sometimes actually, but most of the time, it ends up uh, becoming something that is used to target foreign nationals. Operation Hardstick in Limpopo in 2012, Operation Fiela. Uh, in 2015, uh, Okai Molao, which is the one that's still going on. You know, all these operations, you hear them, 20 foreign nationals were arrested, foreign national shops were searched, this and that were done, and everything is about foreign nationals. This is, this is something that we always hear and we always see, but it could be very good that government initiates these kind of operations and it, it operations uh, are meant for uh, everyone to fight crime, uh, to fight illegal activities. We are not against that. Government has to fight illegal activities, crime, but it should be at the same level with anybody else. But when you have these operations and then you start going to areas like Mayfair, Hillbrook, Sunnyside, Belleville, and we understand who are the people living in that area and why you are choosing those areas. So these kind of things are the things that were happening in the, the country for years. And uh, it doesn't mean that we are, we are keeping quiet or we are not understanding or we are not following. But this is something that I wanted to mention because it is actually uh, uh, difficult to understand in a democratic country, you have those kind of operations, but you are not clearly uh, you know, doing these operations and targeting uh, the criminals, purely uh, tackling criminal activities, but you are targeted areas where you know they are foreign nationals. And then the other thing I want to mention is that it's also um, heartbreaking to see that uh, the Hulian Party's policy documents, starting from March 2020, 2012, are saying that 95% of asylum seekers are not genuine, but they're looking for a job or a business opportunity. I'm sure if you read Fanya's book, you are going to understand what Somalis are going through and went through since 1991. And anyone who understands what Somalis are going through is going to really understand that 95% of asylum seekers, if they are from those countries that war is really waging or war is really happening, for example, like DRC, Somalia, you know, there are a lot of countries where war is happening. In these countries, you cannot claim that the, the asylum seekers coming from that, those countries uh, not genuine. And then the other thing I want to mention is the, the Refugee Amendment um, Act that of 2017 that has came into effect from government uh, that they are no longer interested in protecting the, the rights of refugees and asylum seekers, but rather they are militari militarizing uh, the border and they are actually uh, you know, planning, I think the construction has already started for the processing center. They call it processing center, but we call it concentration center. The reason is because you cannot uh, have a camping um, you know, policy in South Africa that, that the constitution clearly states there's no camping in South Africa. So there we find that there is, uh, there is an intention to make uh, asylum processes difficult for refugees and asylum seekers. Here, we are referring to genuine uh, refugees and asylum seekers. We also believe that asylum seekers themselves are potential refugees. The reason is because when you are an asylum seeker, you are running away from persecution. And then, unless you are tested, interviewed, and facts put together, no one can say you are not, you are not going to be a refugee. So those who are undocumented, or those whose documents expired uh, during lockdown, for example. Now I'm going to the side of immigration and documentation because it's a very important one that I should touch before my time ends. Uh, 
uh, it's a difficult process that many asylum seekers and refugees go through. The refugee reception was closed in uh, 2020 during lockdown uh, in the early uh, you know, times of, uh, of uh, COVID-19. The difficult uh, thing to understand is that uh, in, I think around uh, when the levels of uh, lockdown changed from five to four, three, you know, the Department of Home Affairs was, uh, was changing the way the, the services that they're going to give to, uh, to clients. And then what happened is that the, the Home Affairs Department serving citizens has been open partially. And let me say almost half of it was open. People were not going inside the way they want, obviously queuing outside uh, with social distancing and all that. But they were allowed to get some of the services. The VG reception offices are closed. Those services do not really exist until today. There are few people who might be invited or given an appointment to go to a VG reception office. We were expecting normal phase to reopen the VG reception offices in May this year. And you know, COVID uh, lockdown time, I think we passed almost one, two years now. And it's still locked, it's still closed. It's not really honest about serving refugees and asylum seekers. And uh, we, as the civil society, uh, South Africa Refugee Led Network, Somali Association of South Africa, uh, other NGOs and other organizations that exist in South Africa, we, we are going to fight using the constitution of the country. The constitution of the country is the supreme, court, uh, supreme law of the, of, the, of the land. And there's nothing that stops us from using the, the constitution and the using it for the rights of people who are vulnerable. So refugees and asylum seekers are the most vulnerable communities in South Africa. If you may not know that, maybe you're going to know today. You might think people are very comfortable doing business, running around, but they are just trying to survive. They don't have any other means of surviving. They don't have green IDs. They don't get access to formal jobs. They don't get access to a lot of things that citizens get. You know, by the way, the South African Constitution uh, gives refugees the same rights as South Africans, except that they vote. But in reality, and on the ground, that is not the case. So here, what I'm saying is that, uh, despite the beautiful Constitution, they, it's, it's on paper. Implementing it is a problem. When it comes to the I'm sure some have got also uh, a lot of uh, complaints and queries and challenges. Sorry, Mohammed. We understand the issue of poverty. We understand the issue of unemployment. We understand the issue of crime. But that is not caused by foreign nationals. Sorry, Mohammed. That is not a problem that came from us, from asylum seekers and migrants. Mohammed, can you hear me? Ah, it seems his. Uh... His connection might have dropped. Unfortunately, his bandwidth was very low. He couldn't hear me as I was about to ask him to turn the video off. Um, Vanya, as we wait for Mohammed to come back into the room, um, would you like to perhaps reflect um, before we take a round of questions? Um, yeah, so I think I summed up um, the main, the motivations for the book, what the book's about. Um, I think just the last thing um, that I that I I didn't cover, and I also don't want to take up too much time, um, was the the title is citizen and pariah, and the term pariah um, is really how I frame um, the perspectives of the book, and um, it comes from the the term is, has been used for over a century. Um, to describe people who engage in certain occupations, who migrate, are immigrants. Um, but interestingly, it's also been used 
at a, during a similar period by Sol Plyke, who's a South African author, to describe the situation of Black South Africans um, in 1913 when they're dispossessed of land. Um, and so this term is being used um, both overseas um, to look at people who are um, social and political outcasts, um, who are often landless, and but it's also been used in South Africa. And that's the kind of framing um, of the book. Um, in particular, I draw on Hannah Arendt's um, essays of, um, well, in a book titled The Jew as Pariah, um, where she says the, and I, I felt that mirrored um, in particular the condition of Somali traders, um, where for her, it wasn't so much about their occupations or that they're legally precarious, but that they neither belong to the elite or the, the common people. And that gave them a certain kind of outsiderness and precarity. So the book explores the condition of Somali traders um, as individuals living in South Africa who cannot draw on any kind of elite privilege um, nor can they really draw on, you know, belonging to the common people and the power and force that can often come with that, having a kind of popular, um, a, a, yeah, a, a, a sort of popular to support to draw on. Um, and how do they pursue, how do they navigate laws, pursue justice um, from this um, position? Yeah. Thank you so much, Fania. I think I found your chapter 19 very uh, interesting and thank you for sharing it with us before um, this, this, this session. Um, I think the work and the work overall, the book is commendable. And what I'm interested um, before we, I'm going to open the floor uh, to the audience, what I'm interested from that chapter is um, the way in which you describe the formalization of um, exclusion and how governance uh, uses or rather formalizes, you know, excluding people based on their particular identities and endorsing it as something that is African. Um, I would open, I'd like to open the floor to anyone that might have a question or reflection on Vanya's publication. Well, if, oh, there's Tanya Faber. Tanya, would you like to unmute yourself to pose your question, please? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, hi, Vanya. Thank you so much. Um, I am Tanya Faber from the Sunday Times, and I've also been over the years, you know, writing the kind of articles that you were talking about, um, you know, that, that don't necessarily give the sense of the depth, but just a sudden violent act in this and that. What for you, you know, in your, um, in your very many interviews, you obviously looked at the, the sort of, you know, you spoke about lack of access to formal and informal justice, but can you just tell us a little bit more about the daily kind of lived experiences of the people who you interviewed and some of the, um, the sort of the, the results of the of their day to day living that come from being denied access and being denied you know social currency and that kind of thing. So you know I, I loved how you spoke about the the sounds and the smells and the kind of the feeling of being in these people's homes and understanding more about their lived experience. So what for you really stood out um, from you know from those experiences? Yeah, th thanks for your question. I think. There, there's so many of them. Um, it could be anything from sitting in a shop and some, some customer um, making threats towards the shopkeeper or a passerby saying, hey, Somalian. But there's like, there's, it's, it's not quite friendly. There's a kind of a bit of a tauntingness sometimes to it. Um, it could be, I mean, there's also all these stereotypes of, you know, these shops being like monopolies and shopkeepers being immensely wealthy. And that's not the experience if you look at how they live in their shops. Um, it's complete simplicity. Um, it's um, 
you know, literally just a couple clothes and like, you know, a mattress that's basically, so it's those kinds of things where rather than just saying, oh, well, you know, this is their income or this is, you know, these are the stats, this is what, you, you kind of show the shop and you think, well, this is their day-to-day -day lives. It's kind of a jar with a lot of these kinds of stereotypes. Or you'll visit someone and he shares an apartment with nine other people, a three-bedroom apartment, and you think, okay, well, how, you know, so it's those kinds of things um, in terms of courts. I mean, I went to courts. It doesn't actually feature in the, in the, in the book, actually, but um, one Somali shopkeeper who was assaulted by police, the case got postponed 27 times. So, yeah, it's sort of those kinds of details um, that I think, yeah, are are kind of left out in a lot of the headlines. Um, the experience of someone trying to make inquiries about a nephew who was killed and gets put on all, you know, gets told off and has to go on, you know, get letters from a lawyer to kind of, you know, ask a question about a murder of someone he knew. And so it's those kinds of things which I think are often, um, they fall to the background, but I actually thought that those are actually very important. And I try to, yeah, show more of that in the book than the, the stats and the numbers and the general arguments and, yeah. Um, and, yeah, and I... I I felt I learned a lot about it because I'd sort of overlooked a lot of those things and I only really reflected on, on it properly when I decided to change the style of my writing and all those, I started recollecting all those things. Thank you, Vanya. We also have another question in the room from Astrid von Kotze. Astrid, would you like to ask your question? Not sure if they can hear me, Astrid. Ah, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, Vanya. Um, you named this book, you said you wanted the book to be an intervention. Uh, and I'm going to interpret that from my perspective for a moment and say an intervention might be an educational tool. Um, you also spoke to purpose of the book and you said that it was going to disrupt myths and it was going to reveal the dodgy motivations of political leaders. Um, I'm assuming, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm assuming that there is no guide for activists at the end, but, and here comes the question, what would you like your readers to do when they have read the book? Well, um, thank you for your question. That's a very, and that's a very Astrid question because that's, um, yeah. Um, Astrid's done community education and activism ever since I've known her, which is for like 30 years. Um, so I, I kind of, I, I would say the handbook would need to be written by Abdi Qadir Mohammed or one of his colleagues. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I am more of someone, I see my role more as a facilitator than an activist. I'm someone who gives advice. I'm someone who links people up to other people. Um, and I don't, I, I, I don't see my role as necessarily um, doing the advocacy part of things. Um, so I, for, for that kind of question, I said, that's a good question, Astrid, let me, and in my facilitator role, speak to people I know and think, you know, here's my book, can you read it? Can you help, maybe it can form some of your strategies. Um, so I, I see my role more like that. And I leave in particular, a lot of the advocacy to the trained advocacy people, the experienced advocacy people. Um, and I see myself more just as a researcher, but as a researcher who's trying to influence people's attitudes and the way they think, and also intervene in terms of the discourses um, and the framing of issues. So I hope, I don't think necessarily that, uh, yeah, so I hope that certain key people might read the book, certain influential people, certain activists, 
and they might be in influenced. Uh, it might influence um, their work um, in activism. I can't hear you, Astrid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that good question, Astrid. Um, thanks, Vanya, for that response. Does anybody want to ask any question in the audience? I have a question for you. Oh, I'd allow first my colleague, Vanessa, to pose her question. Vanessa? Not sure if she can hear me. Vanessa, can you hear me? Please unmute. Oh, you cannot unmute. Um, could you perhaps, oh, oh, you wrote, she wrote something in the chat, which we can read out. She says, this has me wondering if there's a connection between pariahs and amapara, which has become a word used to refer to people living on the street, notoriously mischievous and opportunistic. Perhaps something like what we have between amabojwa, which borrows from uh, bourgeoisie. Have you heard of the term amapara, uh, Vanya? It's a word I'm familiar with, uh, commonly used in, in, you know, in South Africa to refer to um, people who live on the street or who move around or loiter in the street. Oh, I. I haven't actually, it's the first time. So I must look into that and yeah, get to get a clearer, I, yeah, I'd be interested to find out what the roots of that term is because it does, you know, sound similar to pariah. Um, and actually the term pariah comes from India. Um, it was used to describe a certain caste, like a very low level Indian caste. And so, yeah, it, it actually um, aligns a bit with that too. So that's very interesting. Yeah. I'd look into that. Thank you. And we ha also have a question from uh, Melanie Judge. I'm not sure whether they can, they would like to ask it themselves. She asked, or they asked rather, how is the law being used to advance the exclusion of foreign traders and what are the implications of this for the rule of law in South Africa? Yeah, so origin, so it, it, it has changed over time. So originally it was informality that was used to exclude foreign traders. Um, and then over the years, it seemed to become the discourse kind of set. And I, I kind of felt that, um, slowly politicians, policymakers be felt more emboldened um, to kind of formally consider um, excluding um, Somali and other um, foreign small business owners from business sectors. Um, and right now, um, I what's interesting is that it's not just um, you know, popular demands and kind of anti-immigrant, um, you know, groups demanding the, the curtailment of foreign shops. It's politicians demanding the same alongside um, these groups. And it's really the courts are actually the only thing right now preventing them from really doing the most extreme types of interventions. Um, imaginable, whether it's setting up, um, yeah, whether it's completely removing asylum seeker and refugee rights to work, which they, yeah, which they tried to do in Gauteng, I think, a year or two ago. And it, it's, if, if it basically, if it were not for the courts right now, we'd have a completely different, um, a, a completely different asylum seeker and refugee policy. Um, and so the question is, how long will the courts be able to um, keep these um, forces, you know, withstand the forces of xenopho xenophobia, anti-immigrant sentiment, and almost like a becoming increasing and almost like increasing, um, yeah, I mean, 
like almost a, a kind of his, hysteria that's taking place in the country. I, 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 I can't, you know, I think right now the courts are still relatively independent and um, intact, but I don't know, like five, 10 years from now. Um, but, but that's where it's at right now. And, and really that's the only reason why um, our refugee and asylum seeker policy is still, as you can hear Abdi Kadir describe that it's not, com it's not actually that um, progressive. It's that refugees and asylum seekers experience many hardships as trying to be documented, but it would be a lot worse if it weren't for our court system. Thank you. Thank you, um, Vanya. Um, since Abdi Kadir is back in the room, we're so sorry that we lost you while you were talking. Um, could you kindly complete your intervention before you got cut, cut off? Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, um, I was cut off by the unstable internet that's um, experiencing today. Uh, uh, I was saying that uh, the last time when I was kicked out by the internet, I was talking about basically where, uh, you know, the rights of refugees and asylum seekers, how governments intending to limit those rights. And uh, I, I would like to add a very important point that people should remember. When people complain and say that uh, our rights are violated, you know, this and that happened to us, there are a lot of people who normally say that, oh, but you guys are too comfortable here in South Africa and uh, you are not even supposed to have those rights. But, but basically, those rights are given to privileged asylum seekers and everyone else in the country by the constitution. We didn't draft the constitution and we are not the ones who give this, those rights to themselves. But uh, I am understanding the the you know, the point where those people are coming from, you know, all these campaigns against migrants that are led by politicians, and some of them uh, openly, you know, going to TVs and saying that foreign nationals have to leave the country, some of them illegal, saying illegal foreigners, others saying all of them, uh, saying they must be restricted, they must not work. So there are a lot of things that are not, you know, coming together here, but we understand that South Africa is a democratic country, and uh, there's a lot of freedom, yes, and people have got freedom, but it depends on what freedom we're talking about. So if it's on a piece of paper and it's not implemented, then you're not going to experience the fruits of those freedoms. So what I'm saying is that South Africa is a good country. It has offered religious asylum seekers, migrants a lot. We are not saying nothing has been offered. We are, we are, we are we are grateful. We are not saying nothing happened for us. But what we are saying is that the laws of the country should be implemented equally, and the rights of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants should be protected. And if they are not protected, we are going to make noise. Obviously, like anyone else makes noise. South Africans have the right to make noise when their rights is violated. But the rights is guided by all of us uh, through the constitution. We are all guided by that constitution. And when we make noise, we should be understood that we are not too comfortable but we are expressing ourselves through the constitution and then the other thing i want to mention is that there is a lot of uh, you know uh, talk about operation Dula and other operations around the country but we believe those kind of operations are not pushed by communities those are pushed by people who are you know have got agendas and uh, it's going to be very very unhealthy for the country and it's going to create a lot of uh, you know uh, challenges for the country. One example I also want to give is that in the, before 2021, when the, the KwaZulu Natal and Houting, uh, you know, incidents happened, many people thought that uh, looting of Somali shops and ransacking was just nothing. It was not painful. People were not feeling it. But when the looting of uh, big businesses happened in uh, KwaZulu, Natal and Johannesburg, people have actually seen what is to, to make people like they have nothing at all when people are trying to survive. So this time around, I'm sure people have seen what is the what is the, the result of looting businesses and how it affects people's lives. And now people have experienced 
So that experience should guide people, should guide the government, should guide communities that uh, being hostile and you know calling for violence and inciting violence is not going to help anybody, including South Africans. What we need is we need dialogue around the country. We need people to hear the plight of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants, and we need people to understand what they are going through. And in the, even in the first place, they need to understand why people are here. Many, many South Africans are not understanding that because they are not informed about it, and there is no uh, social cohesion and there's no integration. This is going to escalate to somewhere else, and it's not good for anybody at all. South Africa is Africa. It's not a country in an island. Africans need each other. We need you today. You need us tomorrow. And this is how the world works. Uh, we were there for South Africa during appetite, the and I'm sure many people do not want to hear that, and they're saying that is that, and this is that. So much for that, I'm sure. Uh, Someone has stopped my video, is a cost. I'm not sure on that, but uh, I'd yes, like sorry. to conclude by saying that we need to work together, academics, government. Yes. OK. Uh, I don't know if uh, you stopped my video or my time is up. Uh, my apologies for Hello? stopping your video, Mohammed. My apologies for stopping your video. Your bandwidth was a bit low, so I was trying to ensure that we could hear you well. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? I just want to conclude. Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Now? Yes, I, I hear you. Okay. No, I just want to close with a statement. Yeah, I just want to close with a statement. I want to say everything that I'm talking about and the challenges and pain that we are experiencing is, is what I was just expressing to you. We, we know we are not South Africans and we came to this country because uh, when I'm saying we, I'm talking about migrants. Just because uh, people run away from persecution and war, nobody wants to leave home and nobody wants to go anywhere that's not their country. Nobody wants to leave away from their home. So, we want to understand Mohammed. Mohammed, we don't hear you very well. Of time that people will be. Mohammed, we don't hear you very well, unfortunately. I'm not sure you can hear me. Sorry, everyone, for that um, bad connection. Um, but I, I believe we we gathered much from Muhammad's reflection on um, just the importance of recognizing the plight of uh, foreign nationals in South Africa. Vanya, unfortunately, I think he's he's been uh, cut off once again. I mean, he was saying some very important things. Um, we've gone past five, and um, could we kindly conclude the session? Do you have any final words? We want to know where we could uh, access your book, um, please. Yeah, so yeah, I, it's a pity that we weren't able to hear Abdi Kadir um, that well this evening. Um, I. Yeah, you can, um, my final words are you can purchase the book um, online at most online retail stores. I think some bookshops are also stocking it. And I just like to thank everyone for attending and I'm very grateful. And if you've got any questions or would like to find out anything further from me, you're welcome to contact me and 
yeah, and I can um, share further thoughts. Thank you once again for allowing us to launch this very important book, very uh, relevant topic um, today, not just in South Africa, but the continent at large. And thank you for everyone for being patient while we had connectivity issues. Unfortunately, we've gone past five. I wish we could continue uh, some more, but I will conclude by inviting you all to um, our humor seminar series. We have a range of series that we have during the week. This is our uh, Monday session, the humor book launch series. You also have book lunch series every Monday at four o'clock South Africa time. We also have the attire series on Thursdays at five. Uh, we have the doctoral series that happens on a Wednesday. So please, please look at our calendar to uh, check when these um, events take place. We're also on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook as well. Kindly look at our social media for any updates. On that note, I'd like to thank Dr. Vanya Castro for her wonderful uh, publication, Citizen and Pariah. This was our humor book lunch session. Thank you for joining us.